Hi everyone, as you know, today is food day at COP28 and I've just met someone really interesting, Henry Dimbleby. Henry, do you want to introduce yourself? I am Henry Dimbleby, the author of the National Food Strategy, which was an independent review for the UK government to set out how we can uh, grow and create enough nutritious food while restoring biodiversity and sequestering carbon. Henry's a food legend in the UK and it's so good to have Corin over here for an interview. So Henry, what's your thoughts been on food at the agenda at this COP this year? Well, I was at the Glasgow COP and this is something a different scale above. And it's, it's really hard when you're here to work out if it's all worth it. It's a kind of massive jamboree, mm -hmm. a kind of market, a lot of deals going on on the sides, mm -hmm. etc., etc. And I think, you know, Fundamentally, two things have, have happened here on policy. Uh, one is that at the beginning there was a kind of slightly amorphous statement saying we should consider food when we think about climate mm -hmm. and nature. And then the other is that food systems have been taken out of the declaration that's going to come out at the end of, uh, at the end of this. So, you know, does that do anything? I don't know. I do, you do feel that, that you do feel two things when you come around here. One is you feel there are a lot of people saying things to each other that they all know. Mm -hmm. But you also feel, and I've certainly found this, that you meet one or two or three people with whom you can really create a connection that actually might lead to change. So, you know, part of me thinks it would be better if the negotiators just got together and negotiated <laughs> in a room without all of this madness. But I guess... You know, maybe there will be connections mm -hmm. that will actually lead to change in the future. Mm -hmm. No, amazing. And I think, like, thank you for describing it firstly so articulately and actually explaining what has happened in such an intense week. You really just hit the nail on its head in kind of articulating so much, like an amalgamation of dozens and dozens of negotiations that have taken place behind the scenes into a really streamlined way. Um, this is, of course, the first time there's been a food uh, day at, COP, at any COP in the last 28 years. Do you think that this is the beginning of food increasingly making um, uh, a recurring appearance in climate? Yes, so I, th I do think that it's now been fundamentally recognised that food is central to this debate. So if you yeah. look at Glasgow, mm -hmm. Glasgow was the biodiversity cop mm -hmm. and food wasn't anywhere in it. It's insane. No. Like, uh, uh, the food system is by far the biggest cause of destruction of biodiversity. It mm -hmm. wasn't central. So it is now, I think, recognised that the food system not only destroys biodiversity, but degrades other resources and is the second largest cause of climate change. And I think that once that's recognised, that will not stop. I think that will carry on. And actually, I think, you know, we in the UK are leading the way, actually, in showing how you can regulate to create a better food system. And I think that conversation has well and truly begun. And it will only happen through regulation. Okay. It's not going to happen just because... Uh, like-minded people want it to happen, you have to change the commercial incentives. So I'm, I'm hearing that you do not believe in self-regulation of businesses and businesses coming in and saying we can get to these targets. Absolutely no, not. so, so uh, uh, and, and no businessman would say that either. So basically, if you are in business, you will invest in something if either you think regulation is going to come in and uh, make what you do illegal, so you can literally be in prison for doing it, yeah. or you think that you can either get the cost down so it's cheaper than what is currently done or sell it for a higher price. And there are kind of niche areas where that's possible. So there'll always be a, a small market, I think, of people who will pay a bit more for regenerative farming. But in the end, we spend $500 billion a year globally, governments do, subsidizing unsustainable forms of industry. And, and that, you're not gonna change the mass market until that changes. You know. Uh, CEOs may do things that are better that uh, that lose them a little profit, but they're never going to do anything that's going to really cut into their profits. You need regulation. No, absolutely. And how exactly does food relate to climate? Why is food important within the climate discourse? Well, first of all, I think you have to think about now, and this is good about this COP, you can't just think about climate, you have to think about climate and nature. Mm -hmm. And so let's start with nature. Food is by far the biggest cause of biodiversity collapse, by far, and we've lost 69% of all species by weight since 1970. It's the biggest cause of the loss of aquatic life, the biggest cause of the degradation of our soils. 
the biggest cause of deforestation, the biggest cause of freshwater pollution and freshwater scarcity. So that's the nature side. And food is also the second biggest cause of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, 20 to 30 percent globally every year. So it is we don't solve either the problem of biodiversity collapse or the problem of uh, climate change without dealing with food.